Welcome everyone to another episode, episode seven of Stars, Planets, and Stellar Rhythms. My name is Eric Roth. I'm your host at, uh, here at Inspiral Nexus, and I am a shamanic astrologer here to bring you more information and sharing about these next few weeks, what's coming up in the astrology, what the planets are doing, and to kind of cap off a little bit of what's happened recently with these planets. So excited to share some really important alignments with the planets and what that really means to us here individually and collectively. So yes, this um, each of these episodes has a particular topic or a set of topics that go into it. The last uh, one in episode six, I talked about the Mars and Aries transit and how uh, vital and critical that's going to be over these next several months, especially as we get into the late summer and through the fall. Uh, we're kind of in the early stages of that particular passage, and then we have an upcoming uh, Mars and Chiron transit that I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about in uh, just here, uh, right shortly here. So here are the three main things I'm going to go into. Uh, Mars Chiron conjunction. Uh, we're going to talk about Eris, what Eris means and why that's playing an important role with uh, the setup of these planets, Saturn, Pluto, and Jupiter and Mars, and what what that means in that space. And upcoming three planetary oppositions with the sun and what that really means uh, to, to say opposition and what that looks like in the sky. Uh, and, it, it, and just to share that it's not about something opposing something else. There's uh, much more to it than just that. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this. But first I'd like to just dive into uh, a space of just honoring creation, honoring our own initiations personally, and those you can bring in your own guides, your own allies to help you through this period of time and to open up to the wisdom of the stars and the planets uh, from all the directions and all our relations and all that came before us and all that comes after. This is, we are each in a role in a sharing with each other. Uh, it's a co-creative effort. And right now we're in this great crossroads, great cauldron of co-creation. And we can acknowledge that, be aware of that, understand that the shadow, the critical shadow that's being brought up right now is also to help us be able to see the light, to be able to see what we can see through the shining on that shadow, the revelation, the revealing, revealing of all that is. Um, critical stage of humanity, and this continues, and we're moving into a, a part two uh, coming here uh, with uh, the part one really taking place uh, beginning in January through, uh, through June. And then part two coming up here, and, and yeah, it's pretty much evenly divided um, as, and, and part two really being uh, coming into to focus with, because of Mars's transit through Aries and, and starting off now with this um, Mars and Chiron uh, conjunction. So let's uh, talk about some flashpoints for this month and what has gone on. In an earlier video, I did talk about the penumbral lunar eclipse on July 4th. Uh, U.S. solar return at 244 years old. So we're uh, you know, now only six years away from getting to that 250 mark and certainly in the um, early stages of what we call Pluto return. That means Pluto has come all the way around to where it was when, uh, when the U.S. was officially born in 1776. Um, I had a really intense July 4th. I can definitely feel, if you will, energetically the, uh, the intensity of the, of the eclipse. It happened right on the U.S.'s natal chart on their, on their natal sun. The sun was, it was a solar return. So it was right where it was. And the moon was on the opposite side of that um, particular uh, part. And um, my ascendant is right in that space of 14 degrees Capricorn. So this took place around 13 and 
13 degrees and some change, the 13 and a half degrees um, Capricorn, the, where the moon was, the sun was, of course, exact opposite in Cancer. Uh, of course, Mars Chiron conjunction coming up July 14th. Let's uh, I'm talk about that shortly. Eris, part of the reason why I'm talking about it is going to be stationary retrograde. It does this every year. Um, and it moves very, very slowly. So, but only I'm talking about Eris in part because of its alignment with other planets. Uh, and that's how, how that's going to play a role here. The three oppositions you can see here, July 14th, the same day that Mars Chiron are conjunct. Then we have a Pluto opposition on July 15th, Saturn on July 20th. And then we have at the beginning of the month, we had a moon on Terry's conjunction, and Terry's the star at the heart of the Scorpion constellation. There's a second one uh, coming up at the very end of July. And then Mercury, um, at the time of this recording, is, is, is about to ready to station direct. So um, that's another, where there's typically three or sometimes four Mercury retrograde time periods. And so we're, we're experiencing this next one, this, this second one here this year. Um, on July 12th, it'll officially be going direct and start its forward motion in um, the sign of Cancer. So we got that at five, about five and a half degrees Cancer. So it's gonna, it certainly was involved in, in part of uh, the, the recent uh, penumbra lunar eclipse. And so it's been playing a role in, in that when it comes to our own mind and our heart space of where we are with that. All right, so let's go into the Mars Chiron conjunction. Yes, this is a, this is a big deal. Um, now Mars and Chiron, about every, once every two years, they go into conjunction. And there are rare, very rare times where there's three conjunctions in a series of a few months. Um, and we can see here that in 1972, um, it was exactly, nearly exact the same place as it, it is here in 2020. And um, that's uh, so the same, Pat Mars is following the same pattern as it's doing this year. It, has, it follows that same uh, pattern, but it just happens to get into a same space where in synchronicity with, uh, with Chiron's pattern. And that was, uh, you know, 40, um, well, 48 years ago here. And Chiron takes anywhere from 48 to 51 years to complete an orbit around the sun. So it just so happened that that got it's, it's been sort of a, a, the next incarnation of this Mars and Chiron um, conjunction. But there was a, a time in 2001 in Sagittarius when Mars and Chiron were conjunct three times. And these, of course, I think that that did play a role as well in the events of 9-11 and what came after that. There was, of course, a Saturn-Pluto uh, opposition at that time, which was one of the main themes of that year. But certainly there were other factors, and this was one of them. What this means? Well, the themes of this year's conjunction, including a grieving of actions related to our common national missions or community missions or global missions related to wars and the soldiers and communi communities have participated in those missions and wars and events, and things where they believe the Aries is all about um, finding a mission and purpose and cause and really going all into that. And with Chiron representing our fracture point, our wounds at a soul level, and translating that into a larger framework of, you know, from when it comes to community, to nation, to globe, this is a time of, of, of grieving that which is once lost, the wounds, uh, you might even say the wounded warriors, the, uh, the missionaries, the people that go in and fight for what is, what is right and just, and even putting themselves on the line for, for healing. I mean, for organizations like Doctors Without Borders or Habitat for Humanity, you know, there's a mission, a purpose behind that, and they can go into places and, and, and they feel they want to do good. From their frame of way, in Aries' point of view, they, they and and that's their purpose. They go for it, and so the this is this is a kind of an honoring time of the sacrifices that are made um, uh, with with Aries, and especially in the uh, sort of the in uh, the violation that Aries has had through all the wars that have had been fought, some 
just, some not so just, but all the all the, the, the tragedies that have taken place and the service that it's done. This can be a time to honor that and to uh, work with ourselves and others that are still working on this within, within who they are and the, the fracture that it caused, the soul wound that it can cause. Um, this is, uh, you know, can bring us a, what I say, a heightened awareness of the wounds birthed from wars, conflicts, sacrifices related to beliefs or purpose which enact those events. So perhaps this is an opportunity to turn the corner when it comes to our view of wars and what this means and that, uh, that to honor the, the process of what it takes and the sacrifices that it, that it brings into the world, not just for men, but for all peoples um, in, around the world, all genders and sexes and all of that. So it's been a huge part of humanity the last few thousand years, but maybe it's a time to relook at that and to it, it really make war something where it truly is a last resort to avoid it instead of using it as just one of your tools in the toolbox. All right, so here's the Mars and Chiron conjunction. Chiron is not visible to the naked eye, but this is where uh, the location is in the sky. So on July 14th, very late in the evening, or if you wanted to get up really early in the morning before sunrise, because Mars won't be rising till um, maybe about uh, uh, four and a half hours before the sun comes up. So it's really, you have to stay up pretty late to, to connect with it. It's in the fish constellation, not to be confused with Pisces, to completely separate. So uh, both in Aries at the nine, de nine degrees and 26 minutes Aries. So this is, I recommend um, for those of you that are early morning risers to, to check that out. Or if you wanted to go out really late at night to also check that out. Now Mars is brightening quite well uh, this month and next month. And it will be uh, more visible in the e er late evening sky beginning in mid to late August. Well, it, where it will rise around the time of midnight or maybe slightly earlier before uh, at the end of August, where it really will become more visible in the evening time though, is uh, September when it starts, slows down and goes retrograde as the earth catches up with that, uh, with Mars in orbit. All right, so let's talk about Eris. Eris, a, uh, something that I'm relatively new to and, originally really inspired um, uh, by two factors. One is uh, Daniel Giomario likes to bring Eris into when we, when we do invocation at classes, he brings Eris in um, and also the astrologer Henry Seltzer who wrote a book called The Tenth Planet which deals with Eris in, on the dwarf planet Eris and what that means uh, from an astrological perspective. And he cites numerous examples of, of how Eris is conveyed in the chart. So Eris has an orbit about twice that as Pluto. And it's a roughly the same size of Pluto. In fact, it's just slightly smaller, but it's located in the Kuiper belt, which is a belt of planets that, that Pluto is in at the edge of that surrounds the, the more well-known solar system that has all the rocky planets and the gas giants takes roughly 559 years. I did see some uh, resources that said 556 years. So you might find both. Uh, again, it's, it's orbit so far out that there, there could be some differences in, 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 in the length of time because we've only known about it since the early 2000s. It's um, in a very slow, it's a slower part of its orbit right now. And it entered the sign of Aries back in 1922. And it, I'm gonna show you a picture of where it is in the sky. It can't be seen with the naked eye. You need a really powerful telescope to even detect it, a uh, professional telescope. And that will, it's not gonna leave Aries, the sign of Aries until the period of 2044 to 2048, when it starts to, begins to transition into the sign of Taurus. So at this time, it really, from calendar year to calendar year, really only moves about a quarter of a degree, roughly about a quarter of a degree in time and in space. So it's really, really, very, very slow. This year on the 
uh, 20th. And see, I've got that uh, 24 degrees, 33 minutes of Aries. And at that time, it's going to be forming what we call T-square. Uh, we're going to be halfway between Cancer and the Capricorn planets. Cancer being uh, at least the, the one that's over there in at, around that zone is the Sun. Mercury will be farther along, not far from the Sun by that point. And um, there, it's in the midst of um, right now, uh, Eris, in the midst of three Sun planetary conjunctions in Cancer and Capricorn. So we're going to get that. It will have uh, three conjunctions with Mars this year. So this is part of that overall uh, feeling about it. Um, and goddess Eris, she is known as the goddess of strife and discord. The Romans called her Discordia. She is a sister to Eris or Aries, A-R-E-S, not the sign of Aries, A-R-I-E-S. Um, but then of course, so she has many other siblings in there, including Artemis. She symbolized certain levels of chaos and trouble for humanity projected by those at that time. And she was the one that offered the golden apple to instigate, like a, as an instigator of the, of the Trojan War. And the reason she did this was that there was a, um, a feast or a wedding that all the gods and goddesses were invited to, except for Eris, because they uh, were labeling her, and in particular Zeus, as a troublemaker. So she got, you know, might say, vindication by bringing the golden apple and starting the uh, the Trojan War with with Helen involved in that, and that, you know, really changed some of the course at that time period of of, of these particular nations. Um, so in the in the chart in the small the astrology chart, Eris is a disruptor of change and an agent of societies of civilizations. She's more of a something that from a um, uh, longer term process, especially for for nations and civilizations, you know, for long term consequences. And for her to come in at this time, it's strongly associated with Pluto, Saturn and Jupiter and squaring them. And then three conjunctions with Mars, she's also providing some additional, uh, might say tumultuous energy, but one that helps us move forward with change helping to break apart what no longer belongs and to uh, maybe open up to new ideas, new ways of doing things, uh, the way we do our systems, our health, educational, and um, uh, social systems, um, political and governmental systems. This is helping open the door to, to that area. So she can help us uncover internal and external conflicts, shadows, and disharmonies. Um, so that is, uh, she can be a really powerful force in that. So the benefits of that is, is for us to break apart what no longer belongs or maybe uh, retool or recalibrate what is and maybe needs to just simply um, uh, be improved and, 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 you know, revamped, if you will. So Eris has a, a sense a little bit of like that Uran Uranian uh, unpredictableness about her and then throwing in some Pluto and maybe even some um, some uh, Aries energy, that 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 feminine warrior, and this is something Henry Seltzer kind of uh, alludes to in his own book um, that I'm still kind of uh, assimilating. Again, this is a new exploration for me, but I wanted to share a bit about Eris in uh, in this video. So here's where Eris is. Uh, is sitting above the Satis uh, constellation, which is the whale, and just around the, what we call the knot of the fish, a star called Alresha, is sitting there between the two fish that jump up uh, above the ecliptic, this, this uh, uh, brownish, uh, yellowish line across the screen here. Aries, or Mars up here, 2012, almost 13 degrees Aries. You can see it's moving closer and closer to moving in conjunction. And uh, Chiron up here at still uh, now moving, um, stationing retrograde. It's actually, I don't list as retrograde here, but she's, or Chiron is uh, retrograde. And then there's Neptune and Uranus. So you've got a lot of activity in this zone all happening there in the, in and around the fish constellation and the ram uh, constellation. 
All right, so planetary oppositions. This is, a, this is important to uh, bring in um, and talk about because every year these planets that we're talking about here, Jupiter, well, really Jupiter on outward, have what we call oppositions with the sun. This means that the sun is on one side of the sky and that planetary body is on the other side of the sky. Uh, a great uh, visual representation is the full moon. So we see that quite well. It's uh, you're brilliantly lit and you can't ignore it. And you can see it just about anywhere unless it's, uh, unless it's cloudy and, and, and wet. Uh, but generally speaking, we can, we can all uh, cast our gaze upon it. And we see that it's a reflection of the sun and it is an, a powerful illumination. But it's also when a planet does that same thing. It's like, think of it as a, uh, a full moon, but, it, but, but with a planet. We're seeing the fullness of the reflection of the sun upon the planet, the fullness of the energy associated with that planet astrologically, symbolically speaking. And so we have here the 14th, 15th, and 20th, Jupiter, Pluto, and Saturn all go into opposition. So that's just another pointer to say how uh, they've been clustered together for several months now. Um, another factor to see is that this is the halfway point between uh, the, when the planets station retrograde and when they station direct. So when these planets station direct, it's going to be in September and uh, early October uh, because they stationed retrograde in uh, April and into May. So we're getting into that halfway mark right now with these particular planets. So I'm going to give you some visuals to give you a better indication, be able, uh, understanding, especially for those that are unfamiliar with this kind of an alignment. Again, it doesn't mean that the opposition means that something is opposing something else. It's that it's, connect, it's, it's a polarity that's being activated. It's a polarity between two objects and that the, we happen to be on Earth sitting in between that. So we get the advantage of seeing that polarity. And as you'll see here, um, right here we have the Earth in between the Sun and Jupiter. This happens on the July 14th, so a few days after the recording of this video. And you can see Saturn is going to be moving into opposition too as the Earth moves a little bit faster along the line of its orbit and then uh, catches up with Saturn fully and then becomes more officially in between. But right, I mean, we're in that in-between zone already right now. Now, Pluto is off the screen here, but it will be uh, somewhere in this vicinity, uh, closer to uh, where Jupiter is in its alignment, but they're all kind of in that space there. And we can see these other, these other, the three inner planets here, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, and how Earth is catching up with Mars, and that'll, that'll go into opposition in uh, October, October 14th, and how Venus and Mercury have already sped past uh, Earth. Um, Venus did this, uh, was, Venus ended up in, becoming in between Earth and the Sun back on um, uh, early June, and rising as an early morning star on June 10th, and then uh, Mercury is um, retrograding as it's, you know, as it was in that in-between zone and then it's gonna go uh, direct now. And then it's, you're gonna see it move farther along that, that line there. So here is uh, an example of what the sky will look like here with um, uh, on July 20th, Saturn opposition we can see these three planets. We can't see Pluto, not visible to the naked eye, but I see it here just for placement only so that you can connect that that's where it is located in the sky, just between the Archer constellation and the Goatfish. Saturn at 2838 degrees retrograde, um, Pluto and Jupiter are only about two degrees apart at this point, but all three are in retrograde. So whenever there's a planet that's in opposition from Mars on outward, these planets will always be in retrograde. This is how that works. Um, and um, Mercury and Venus cannot go into opposition uh, with the sun because they are they orbit inside uh, Earth's orbit. And so we only experience the conjunctions and just a little bit of distance um, from our perspective staying on Earth that they separate from the sun. 
All right, so Capricorn. This is really the big emphasis here with these oppositions. Uh, any planetary body that is always in retrograde motion and it looks like it's moving backwards. So there's a certain, it's providing a certain emphasis and a retracing over its steps in specific areas of the sky and, and the sign. In this case, it's Capricorn. So this month features three planets in opposition and places additional illumination upon the intent of the Capricorn sign and what each of the planets bring to the table, uh, help educate, guide, rebirth humanity at this uh, really critical juncture of both evolution and involution happening. So it isn't just up and out, but it's down and in, in a big way. So it's a time of focusing upon what we want to seed for the long term. And I'll give you some bullet points here on the, on the right hand side of the screen here. Seeding long term future, making choices that build harmony in our culture and human systems, including health, economic, social, political, governmental. Letting go when no longer is healthy and or have completed with. Facing the shadow of what has been buried in the unconscious, making it conscious. So it's uh, not ignoring, it's facing. It's like, hey, you know, in order to grow, we've got we've to face our, our, our issues. We, we can't just uh, run around without uh, looking at that because uh, eventually it's going to catch up and uh, create drama. And, and that's what's happening here in the United States. We're seeing that especially with the, uh, the economic system, the vulnerabilities in that space. Uh, certain technological limitations, the health systems, as well as social, uh, you know, the, the shadow of our social structure. Um, different uh, kinds of, of people here that um, have been, in this case, been listed as minorities and have been uh, a subject to social injustice for uh, hundreds of years. And we're now, we've never truly healed uh, really from the time this country was founded and uh, our conquering of the continent and Native Americans and uh, the slavery, the, and then the new populations coming in from different other countries over time. This is really uh, a really golden opportunity for us to uh, heal from this period. Uh, Chiron in Aries, for example, is also contributing to this and helping us come to terms and allowing us to experience that. If we choose to, now we can ignore and create even more drama and separation and uh, you know, distancing, but I, don't, I, I have a little bit of faith here that we are going to open up and, 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 and do the real work that has been long needed in this world, especially in the healing department here. Um, here's some sl two slides I'm going to bring up here. This first one, but uh, ones I used in 2017 when I recorded um, No Easy Way Through video about the 2020 planetary alignments and, and something we can do to prepare, uh, participate authentically in these times. So in this, regardless of whether we're in a cycle or not personally, everyone will be at the effect of, if you will, this planetary alignment. We can honor these transits and these planets by focusing on what needs to transform, compost, and build anew in the future. This is long-term consequences. Like you cannot, this is not just a temporary situation. Uh, COVID-19 here right now, I do uh, have this general feeling that while we will um, uh, ultimately thrive from the passage of this virus, it's gonna be here with us. And we're gonna be here to work with it on, on a spiritual level. What does that really mean? This is one of the questions that we are finding out as we're working to save lives and working to uh, better our health system and find out what we can do in the future to prevent this kind of uh, tragedy or at least mitigate it on some level with with more conscious uh, and maybe you have a more healthy population where the, that's part of the problem we're seeing now is that there's a lot of unhealthy people out there that have uh, uh, in some cases really uh, the effect of, of, of the environmental stresses, dietary stresses and certain other stresses that have come in. This is uh, a time we can see the vulnerable, the vulnerability in our system and, and how we govern 
and have maybe established a certain, a, a, a better way, a better system, a better structure for us to work with that more, full, um, more uh, uh, in, a, in a more healthy way. Everything about our civilization right now is at a crossroads. This is, that's what I was writing back in 2017. Uh, from powerlessness, we can surrender to our own power to choose a mo our more harmonious direction available for all of us. So this is, uh, you know, what are the long-term consequences for our lives? Some of these other things we can talk about, uh, realizing that the crossroads are not to bind us, but to free us through choice. That the foundation of what we have is cracked. We know that it's going away and we have an opportunity to build an entirely new foundation. Um, governance, all of our systems and structures that are robust, but need help uh, across the globe, not just here in the United States. And on a personal level, having faith in our own decisions, deciding what we truly want can be the hardest and most courageous thing that we can discover for ourselves. And to be not just discovering what we truly want, but actually taking action or thought or commitment to toward that, toward that goal and um, working with that and uh, not allowing our, I mean, looking at our dreams and what can we can bring our dreams into reality and what, what can actually manifest. This is a time where we can see what can actually manifest. Not fighting our past, putting it all on the table and being absolutely honest with ourselves. This is it, this is the time. And I encourage all of you to, to connect with these planets out there in the sky, to um, meditate with them. This, these are, I look at this from a shamanic perspective as spirit guides, um, that we are here, not from a cause and effect standpoint, but working in relationship with them. And I go out there every night to uh, connect with them, even if it's cloudy, just to be under the sky a little bit and um, just be open. Uh, meditate and, and share my gratefulness, uh, blessing of this of this creation that we all are all a part of here. So that's what I've got for you today, and I encourage each of you to uh, you know uh, feel free to send me any questions or thoughts you might have. Uh, there's going to be more of this. I just got fish, finished with a, uh, a little road, mini road trip that I did down in Southern Oregon and uh, got to wear masks during uh, readings. And um, I got to experience a different way of doing a, a little class as well um, with, the, uh, with the COVID virus. So um, really feeling uh, excited about the future, but knowing uh, that there is still more growing pains ahead for us and uh, it's up to us to choose how we want to experience that and some degree some of it is beyond our control but our own selves we can we can show up for for our lives and 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 be truly be part of who we want to be and follow our soul's intent so i thank all of you for being here and for uh, watching this um i um you know uh, really am uh, hopeful and I have certain faith in humanity that we will get through this but there's more to come and uh, it's it's a long journey it isn't just a, something temporary but it's a long journey so I wish all of you well and uh, that peace be with you